welcome to the first episode of our Tower Unite laser projector tutorial. This series will show you how to use the laser projector to its full potential by explaining the coding system behind it and how to use it effectively. Each video will build on top of the last, so I recommend you watch these in order to get the full experience. This series of videos is perfect for furries, weeaboos, any member of the Tower Unite community. Out of all the creative things you can use in Tower Unite, the laser projector has the most untapped potential. Very few people know how to use it effectively, and those who can are able to create some pretty cool things. They can be useful, or they can be pretty, or they can be a combination of the two. There's a pretty disappointing lack of laser creations in the condos I've seen, and I want to change that for the better. So let's begin. In the beginning, there was darkness. It propagated throughout the whole universe. The Overseer, an omnipotent being by the name of Mac D. Guy, had noticed this, and was disgruntled by it, as he found it boring. And so, he did what any head developer would do. He created light. He realized that if he were to make his players happy, he would have to give them the power to control this beautiful light. Thus, he brought forth a diet of five variables. These ultimate beings were to be the ambassadors of control. All control of light was to be done through them. There was X, ruler of horizontal position, and her brother Y, ruler of vertical position. These two worked in tandem to create two-dimensional space, the flat workspace of all the controllers. And then there was H, the ruler of hue. He brought forth the ability to control the colors of the lasers. He could create any color on the RGB spectrum. There was S, ruler of saturation. He controlled the colorfulness of the lasers, from blank white to full color. Finally, there was V, the most powerful, yet the most overlooked. She controlled the value of the lasers from completely invisible to fully bright. These five worked together as the sole controllers of the lasers. The infinite was achievable with them. Hmm. What a nice story. Now, where were we? Oh, yeah, 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 the lasers. Okay. So hopefully that little video gave you a uh, basic understanding of what each of these five output variables does. And so I'm just going to really quickly demonstrate each of them. So X prime, as you may know, is horizontal position and Y prime is vertical position. So this grid or rather any actually like any any shape, any default shape or grid, as you can see up here, will fill a square from negative 100 to 100 on both the X and the Y. So if I set X to negative 100, it sets each laser to have an X coordinate of negative 100. And I'll set Y to be 100, for example. So you'll be you'll you'll see the lasers are at negative 100, 100, as if they're on like a coordinate grid. You saw that X prime and Y prime were both equal to X and Y respectively. I'll get to what that means a little later in the video. So H, as you may know, is the hue, S is the saturation, and V is the value. So that, that's just the color, how colorful it is, and how bright it is. So I'm going to set these back to zero, so it's just a little bit easier to, to see and comprehend, I guess. So saturation goes from zero to one, zero being completely white, and one being completely colored. So I'm going to keep that on one because it has like some nice color to it. And so H goes from zero to 360. That goes through the entire... RGB color spectrum, the the whole rainbow, kind of like kind of like going around the color wheel like that clockwise, starting at red on zero, all the way around to 360, which is again red. So I can set it to things like a 20, that's kind of reddish orange. I could do 120, that's a green. 240 is blue, and you'll see 360 is red. I can make it go higher than 360, but it'll just loop back around to what it would be if you were to subtract 360 until you got something less than 360. So for example, 380 would just be the same as 20. So my favorite color is green, so I'm just gonna keep it green for now. Uh, saturation, I'll play around a little bit with that. So if I set it to 0 0.5, you'll see it's kinda kinda duller, almost almost uh, kind of like a bright green. And if I make it 0 0.2, you can see you can almost barely see the color, but it's mostly white. So as that increases, you can see it gets 
more and more colorful. And then the value is just how bright each laser is. So I can make like 0.5, it's fairly dim now, 0.1, it's just a little pinprick right there on the wall, just barely visible. And one, of course, is fully bright. The main difference between input variables and output variables, of course, is the name. Output variables are used for outputting data from the editor, from the code, into the lasers, while input variables actually allow you to input important pieces of data based on things like the time or the default positions of the lasers or how many lasers there are into the code. So there are actually twice as many input variables as there are output variables, so this may take a bit longer, but it's definitely worth it to know how they work. I reset the laser expression to its default state to explain something very important about how the code actually works. Instead of the code being ran at the same time for all the lasers at the same time, what the code actually does, what, whatever you put in here in the expression editor, is actually ran for each laser individually. That's how we're actually able to create crazy shapes and complex patterns and stuff. Because if we were to run the exact same code for each laser, we just get a dot. We just have, like, every laser will be doing the exact same thing. So this means that the input variables can actually have different values based on the laser that the code is being evaluated for. So the default laser expression actually has two input variables in it already, x and y. So don't confuse these with x prime and y prime. x prime and y prime are for the output. x and y are inputs. What these variables are are actually the default x and y coordinates for the lasers, depending on the shape you choose up here. So let's say I did like a circle. x is actually the default x coordinate, the horizontal coordinate, for each laser, and y is the default vertical coordinate for each laser. So let's say I were to change y to zero, you'll see that the circle flattens out. That's because the x is still the same. The x is still the default x, which is just the circle. You'll see like if I move my mouse around, you'll see the x sort of changes along with the line at the center. But I've set every y to zero, so it's just gonna be this flat line here. And then I can, if I can change it back to y, and you'll see I've basically given the y coordinates, the default y coordinates, back to the each laser. And if I set x to 0, you'll see the y coordinates are still the same, they're just what they are default-wise, but all the x's are 0, so it just forms this vertical line. So the way the code differentiates each laser from the other is that each laser has its own index number, ranging from 0 to however many lasers there are, minus one. So for example, in the 5x5 five five rectangular grid, there are 25 lasers. So the index numbers will, will range from zero all the way to 24. And this is represented by the input variable index. So in order to show you how the index variable can actually be used, I'm going to use it in a way that's not really very practical, but that's just because I haven't been able to explain some of the more advanced topics to you. So I'm just going to have to use it in kind of a weird way, but it'll definitely still show you how this can actually be used. So I'm going to set the Y coordinate of every single laser to zero by simply setting Y prime to zero. So that'll just set the Y coordinate of every single laser to zero instead of its default Y coordinate, which is just labeled as Y as we've established before. So I'm just going to keep that at zero. And then I'm going to set X prime to index. So what this has done is set each laser's x coordinate to its index, ranging from 0 to 24. So it's it's kind of visible, like you, you can't really see each laser, but you can definitely see it's formed a line. So I can actually change how long this line is by increasing the lengths of the grids, just how many lasers there are, and you'll see it gets longer. And that's because the index of each laser gets higher and higher, of course, as you go through the lasers. And that means the x coordinate is going to be higher and higher, so it keeps moving farther to the right. Thus, it creates this horizontal line. I can also make the line vertical simply by setting the x coordinate of every single laser, x prime, to 0, and then the y coordinate of every single laser, y prime, to index. And that'll make the line go vertical from 0, 0 instead. That, and that's because 
as I go through the lasers and the well as the code goes through the lasers and the index gets larger and larger ranging from 0 to 100 in this case because 5 times 20 is 100 of course you'll see the line goes from y coordinate 0 to y coordinate 100 and that's because I've set as you can see the y coordinate to the index of each laser the next up of variable is count it's not really useful in creating any kind of display mechanic, but it is very useful in calculating things. Count simply tells you how many lasers there are in the expression. So for example, in this 5x5 five five grid, count will equal 25 because it's a 5x5 five five grid and 5 times 5 is 25. And then in the shapes, most of these will actually have a count of 32. So count is just equal to however many lasers there are in the expression. The next input variable actually ties the last two variables together in a way. It is called fraction. What it is, is actually the index of each laser divided by the count of the expression. So this actually maps each laser to a number in between 0 and 1. So this is very useful for, for example, mapping, like I said, all of the lasers to a certain uh, data group. For example, the value here, this is pretty. This is a pretty good example because um, it's like highest value is 1. So what I can do is just set it to fraction. And so what that'll do is set the value of each laser to its fraction, its index divided by its count. And so because it starts at the 0 and goes all the way up to 1, that means as we go through the lasers, um, the grid actually goes from left to right, from top to bottom. You can see it gets from value 0, uh, completely invisible, to value of almost 1, which is pretty much fully visible. You can also use this to edit something like saturation, which is also based on a maximum value of 1. So I'm going to set the value back to 1, set the hue to something like uh, 120, which is green. Actually, let's do 240, just for a little change. That is blue. Then I can set the saturation to a fraction, and you'll see as we go through each of the lasers, it gets more and more blue. And that's because its its value, no, sorry, its saturation is equal to its fraction, which ranges from 0 to 1, from white to fully colored. So the next three variables are actually based on Unix time. So if you're not really sure what those are, we've created a little side video explaining what it is, why it exists, what it does, uh, stuff like that. So the first one is simply called time. What it is, is just the value of Unix time at that current moment. So you can actually use that with uh, what is called a modulo function, um, which is denoted by a percent, which basically is used for finding remainders. I'll talk about it in a later video. You can use it to actually find the seconds, minutes, hours, and maybe even days in Unix time, in the Unix actual like value. And you can use that to make clocks and calendars and things like that out of lasers, which are pretty cool. Next up is projection time. That actually tells you how long the projection has been going on. Uh, this is this includes when you've turned on the laser projector, or if you have like a sequence going on and it switches to the current the, the expression that we're talking about. Or maybe if you're like looking at the different expressions you have manually, just clicking on them and you happen to click on one with projection time in it. All it does is just log how long the projection has been going on. So in order to demonstrate that, I'm actually going to set all the y's to 0. And I'm going to set x to projection time. Um, it's projection, capital T, time. So it's a little hard to see, but if I zoom in, you'll see the dot is actually moving across the wall. And that's because the projection time is slowly going up. Uh, by the way, it's in seconds, just like Unix time. So I can actually sort of exaggerate this if I multiply the projection time by something. To multiply, you just use an asterisk. So I'm going to do five times projection time. You can see it's moving a bit faster now. Uh, how about 20? There we go. Now it's moving pretty quickly. All it's doing is just moving to the right because I've set the x coordinate to projection time, which is constantly, which which is just increasing at a constant rate. Just one every second, but in this case, it's multiplied by 20. The last input variable, and also the last time input variable, is known as projection start time. Projection, 
capitalist start, capitalist time. And that is simply the Unix time right when the projection is started. Like like I said before, like uh, turning it on or switching to that expression or switching that expression in a sequence. It's just simply a fixed value of what Unix time is precisely at that moment when the expression is started. So I'd like to mention one last thing about variables before I end the episode. You can actually create your own variables by adding numbers or multiplying numbers, just doing operators or whatever, to other variables. So the way you do this is just create a new line, preferably at the beginning, so the program knows to use the variable throughout the entire code. Uh, let's just call it, I don't know, var. Um, we do var equals and then the value. So we can do something like, I don't know, time minus 300, for example. That I don't know what you could use that for, probably just to offset the time by 300 seconds, just like rewind time, 300 seconds. Uh, and then you just put a semicolon after it. So this var, wherever you put var later in the code, it's just going to be equal to whatever you set the variable to be. So you can set the variable to be whatever you like, just any kind of set of operators um, paired with other variables and numbers and whatnot. Here's a quick summary and showcase of the different output and input variables. The output variables are what control the lasers. These are X prime, horizontal position, Y prime, vertical position, H hue, S saturation, and V value or brightness. Then there are the input variables, which are values based on outside information. There are X and Y, which are the default horizontal and vertical positions respectively of each laser. Index, the number of each laser from 0 to however many lasers there are minus 1. Count, the amount of lasers there are in the expression. Fraction, index divided by count. Time, which is the current time in Unix time. Projection time, how long the projection has been going on for. And projection start time, Unix time at the beginning of the projection. And that's about it for variables. In the next episode, we will talk about functions, what they are, what they do, and how to use them in your expressions. Thank you very much for watching.